A momentous week, an incumbent congressman gets a pink slip, the shocking presidential debate, and the city gets a new budget. The point starts right now. Mayor Adams said he would land the plane, and he did. An 11th hour budget deal that is good news for many, many people. So, Mr. Mayor, your original budget was sort of doom and gloom. You had the migrant crisis. Now, all of a sudden, everything is happiness and light. What changed? Well, well first, how do we get here? And what many people don't realize, early in the administration, when I first got elected, we immediately reached out to all of our agencies and said you had to find efficiencies. Little did we know that we were going to need those extra dollars uh, due to well, we had a, over $7 billion gap. We had a lot of programs that were sunsetting because they were being held up with temporary stimulus dollars, we had union contracts to settle, uh, which we were able to accomplish. And then out of nowhere, 200,000 migrants and asylum seekers, over $4 billion. So our early preparation allowed us to look at uh, tax receipts better than we thought, and we were able to really uh, land the plane. But see, this budget is about a billion dollars more than your original proposal. Is that all just increased tax receipts? No, it's a combination of things. Uh, and we always have to be fiscally conservative. You know, others can say, you know, just spend, 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 but we can't get it wrong. And so as my, Jock Jihar, my budget director, he's constantly ma ma uh, watching and managing the tax receipts so we can get it right. Because we can't go back later after we pass the budget and then talk about devastating these entities that were looking for the money. So what do you think was the most meaningful change in this budget, the things you were able to restore? A oh, com combination of things. Uh, number one, when you look at uh, our cultural, cultural institutions, uh, we were able to put $58 million in our cultures, reaching out to them, and they were constantly calling me. And I said, listen, have faith. You know, listen, I love my museums. I love my cultures. Have faith. Let us do this. And then when you look at the $53 million that we put back libraries, in libraries. Seven days a week. Now. Exactly. And I said it often, even when I was on the show. I said, Marsha, I got to let us, you know, figure this out. As any parent knows, when you are managing your household, you have to make sure that you're making the smart decision. And then the $100 million we're putting back into the school system. When you do an analysis, we have taken the hit that, okay, you guys are hurting school system. There hasn't been a mayor that has put more money, over $500 million, all our pre-K, 3 k all of these programs were sunsetting. But now we have put permanent dollars and not temporary dollars. So what happens if more people apply for, apply for pre-K and 3K than the money allows? What's going to happen? Do so you have to expand? And I made it clear. Every child that wanted a seat will have access to a seat. And we're constantly shifting. This is the problem we were having. And, you know, it was really challenging to communicate this to people. The previous administration had a large number of seats, but there were no children in the seats. So taxpayers were paying for seats without bodies in the seats. We're realigning the program. We're identifying exactly where the need actually is. And trust me, it takes a lot of guts and courage to say we, we have to do this right. Because you take a lot of inco uh, income and criticism, but when you New Yorkers go back... a lot of income and criticism. Oh, but when New Yorkers look at, here you have a mayor and an administration that said we're not wasting taxpayers' dollars, and we're not just going to do things because it sounds good to do it. We have to get quality for the product that taxpayers are paying for. So if more people show up and they say they want pre-K and 3K, are you going to add more money to the budget so that they can have seats? Well, the budget is going to be locked in, but we're adding new seats. Uh, we're adding uh, new money already, and we're aligning the seats where the needs are, and really hats off to the city council who have been a real partner in doing this. I wanted to also ask you about changes to the Fair Fair program, because I know that this is going to allow more people who are, um, to apply and get um, um, a break on taking subways. Yes, millions of dollars uh, we are putting into the fair fares. Uh, we think it's important that people, uh, if you're able to bring down the cost of your transportation, uh, that metro card cost goes a long way. And you know, the city council again, uh, uh, Speaker Adams, hats off to her. Uh, this was one of the things that were important to her. It was important to me as a former transit cop. No one wants to arrest someone for hopping the turnstile. We need to give them the assistance they deserve. So, do you think this is going? 
going to reduce fare evasion? Hopefully so. But you know what's interesting, uh, Marsha? I was on 125th Street and Lexington Avenue um, doing an operation there with the transit police personnel. You, it was amazing how many people walked through the gate and had money to pay, but just, just believed they shouldn't pay. That's unfair to New Yorkers who are paying. Everyone should pay their fare unless you have extenuating circumstances. You could go to the token booth and speak to the individual there. But there were a lot of New Yorkers who got accustomed, although they had the money, they said, let other New Yorkers pay for it. And we said, no, to that. If you have money to pay, you will pay or you will, you will get the repercussion. Subway, and there are a lot of people who have trouble making the fare. Mm -hmm. So this is actually going to help them and I was I would imagine it may reduce fare evasion. And that's our goal, you know, and our goal is really working class people because the city must be affordable to them. That's why you're seeing over $2 billion we're putting into affordable housing. We, when you do an analysis of our administration from dropping the course of uh, child care from $55 a week to less than $5 a week, high speed broadband to our NYCHA resident, residents, invested in foster care children, you see this whole package of saying, how do we make this city more affordable within our uh, powers, like to earn income tax credit? There's a whole list of things that we're doing. But so at the beginning of your fiscal dance this past year, the, the cost of migrants was a big concern, and you announced a whole bunch of cuts that you thought you were going to have to do, but now you don't have to do. What changed? I mean, why are you still getting this influx of thousands of people right, every right, week, right. and how are you able to afford to do all these great things when before it was going to be doom and gloom and we're going to cut everything? Well, we're not out of, out of the woods, and I want to be clear on that. But here's what happened. While Jock Jihad was managing the dollars, I also had Deputy Mayor uh, uh, Williams Isom to say, how do we bring down the population? If we would have sat on our hands, we would have had 200,000 people in our system where we would have to pay for. But I said, no, we need, just as I'm asking my agencies to do efficiencies, we need to come up with initiatives that will drop down that population. And that's what we did. 30, 30 days, 60 days. People say, oh, this is terrible. It was not. The majority of people found their way. That's how it is in America, and that's how it is in New York, and we did it in a humane way. You don't see people sleeping along our streets, our highways. We have been successful in dropping our population, and we're still getting over 4,000 a month. <laughs> that's a real number. Is that still going to be a budget problem? Yes, it's a, it's a huge problem, and the federal government should pay for this. And most importantly, Marsha, we should allow people to work. What is more dignified than having a job? And they want to. Those migrants and asylum seekers are saying to me, Mayor, we want to work. We want to be part of, of the city and give back to the city and not have to sit here and depend on the city. So a tangential problem for you is the lifeguard problem and yes. the problems of having to possibly close or waves of closures for several city pools and beaches. Tell me about that, and are you able to hire more lifeguards? Is there more money to hire more lifeguards? Oh, we definitely have the money to hire lifeguards. We were successful over the off-season uh, to renegotiate with the unions, which was really difficult in holding our lifeguard population by some of the stringent rules. Uh, we were able to uh, settle a good contract, give an incentive, uh, retaining uh, incentive to do so. We opened uh, 50 pools, the Astoria pool, uh, over 100 years, uh, it has been there. We were able to open it in one year. We were able to renovate it and open the pool. And that's, it, that's what's exciting. And as I took a lot of criticism for, our migrants from West Africa, South America, Central America, they can become lifeguards if we give them the ability to work. And I will continue to lean into that. But are we looking at rolling closures over the course of the summer because you don't have enough lifeguards? No, I, I, the numbers, I believe, is up to a little over 500. We sort of, uh, where we were last year, uh, we were, we're better than we were last year on the lifeguards uh, sh shortage issue. But we need people to come and be a part of lifeguards. Young people, this is a good way to start employment and you, we we want to encourage them to become lifeguards so let's talk about the elephant in the room what's that the democratic debate for president i want mean the, 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 debate the, for president. the elephant is for the republicans right? no 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 but, I mean, you, know, you know what the elephant is i mean the, you, there's a lot of talk the day after the uh debate about the uh need or the possible need to replace uh, joe biden as a candidate do you think that that's 
something that the Democrats should do, and do you think that it's possible to do it? Well, listen, those decisions are made by people uh, that are over my food chain of, you know, the, the all presidential candidates, particularly President Biden, he has a team of people that will look at all of this and analyze. I think he started out slow. Uh, he started to pick up as he went on. And, you know, there's another uh, debate coming up. And I don't know if a lot of people remember I don't know if you remember the first debate that President Obama did, the first debate that others have done, and you normally have an opportunity to come back around and really speak your vision to New Yorkers so and to Americans. You don't think this is a fatal wound? No, during the campaign, you get wounds, you know, and that's part of campaigning. I had a couple of wounds on the campaign trail, you know, and you feel them. And the, the question becomes your ability to recover. That's what it's about. So can he recover? Uh, listen, his experts would do that. I don't want to do anything that's going to interfere with their strategy and plan. Uh, I know that the, the president has been good for our city in many areas. We dif disagree on how the migrant crisis was handled, but when it came down to funding public safety, uh, revitalizing our economy has been a W, and I'm hoping uh, that his team put the plan together for the recovery. So thank you so much for thank being you. here. We're going to have to leave it right there for now, but we'll be back with our panel to tackle what turned out to be a week of political upheaval at home and across the nation.